Well, happy Easter, Amber Lee. Welcome back. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. We are in a series called Easter People, and we are looking at some of the significant stories of those whose lives have been impacted uh, by the resurrection of Jesus. And on this very special Sunday, we're going to look at two guys um, who I think we can learn a lot from. We began several weeks back with this idea of the show must go on with apologies to the circus from which this uh, statement originated uh, and that Easter is the greatest show. Show being defined as a spectacle, a display, something that demonstrates something. And that's Easter to a T, isn't it? I mean, just think about what happened in the garden. The stone is rolled away. I mean, how dramatic is that? The grave clothes of Jesus left in the tomb. And and by the way, they were folded. This is not someone who was stressed or in a hurry. You know, of course, you've risen from the dead. What are you going to do? You're going to make your bed, right? Of course. Jesus folds folds up the clothes and and then walks out nonchalantly. And then the, the soldiers are just falling over stupefied and angels show up. I mean, this is a display. This is a demonstration. And that's, you know, just what we can see with the naked eye. I mean, that's what we see from our human perspective. The In the unseen realm, there's a whole demonstration of God's power as well. In fact, if you were with us on Good Friday, we talked about um, how in that moment, everything changed. Well, we looked at Colossians 2, where it says that the moment Jesus died, he showed up in the realm of the dead. In fact, the Apostle Paul, the author of Colossians, put it like this. He says, he took away the weapons of the powers and authorities. He made a public show of them. He won the battle over them by dying on the cross. What Paul is saying in Colossians 2 is that when Jesus died, it was the death of death. You know, imagine that the the enemy was just like fist pumping and then all of a sudden there was a tap on his shoulder and, and he turns around and there's Jesus saying, okay, well, just turn it over. Turn what over? Turn over the keys to death. Turn over the keys uh, to hell for, for I will live and but but death must die. There was a triumphant spectacle that took place as Jesus marched the devil and the demons up and down the corridors of eternity and showed that they had been defanged. This is the greatest show. Easter, a spectacle, a demonstration, a display. And today, and today, we're going to see how the show on the road. Today, let's meet, let's meet two men who meet Jesus on the road. Let me read you this passage. This is Luke 24, verse 13. It says, now that same day, now that's Resurrection Sunday, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Calliopus, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem? And do not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things? Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, he replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who had said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, 
How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. And Father, I believe, I believe that even just in the reading of your word, it has power, power to shape us, to encourage us, to calm us, to wake us up. And I pray for those of us who are watching this in in our homes, in our apartments, our condos, our vehicles, I pray that as these words that these words would penetrate us, that we would encounter you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So Mark Twain once said that golf is a good walk spoiled. Well, not being much of a golfer myself, I've always kind of liked that, right? I mean, why not just take a walk? Why mess with a walk? with the pressure of you know, trying to get a little ball into a little hole. Like, why bother? Well, this story is not about a good walk spoiled, but rather a sad walk brightened. These two were sad as they walked on the road. The text says that their faces were downcast and that they stood still when Jesus said, Hey, wh- why are you so sad? They stopped, implying that they were indeed walking. They stopped because they were stunned that anybody would not be sad, that, that, that there would be anybody around who wouldn't understand the cause of their sadness. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? How quickly what you thought was going to be your life can just kind of come to an end. It can get derailed. It feels a bit like you know, a horrible sensation when you're, when you're sleeping and you have that weird feeling like you're falling, right? Yeah. Have you ever had that where, where you're, we're just kind of lurched awake. It's an awful feeling, isn't it? You just fall asleep and then you have this weird dream and then the whole ground gives way beneath your feet and you're free falling. For many of us, that's how this time right now feels. It's been a year of turbulence. 2020 was shaping up to be this amazing year. 2020, the year of vision. I even preached a sermon back in January of 2020. It was a series called uh, uh, you, you, 2020 Vision, You in Five Years. Well, maybe we're going to have to make that six years now because we've all lost a year. But it was like we went into a free fall, wasn't it? For over a year now, I have been preaching to you via this this camera. We're wearing masks to go to grocery stores. We're wearing masks to go to school. We're, we're trying to be safe. We're, we're distancing and now we're waiting with bated breath for our time to get a vaccine. When we started 2020, did we think we would be here a year later? How, how are we now in what is becoming normal a minute ago it was absolutely a ridiculous concept it was unthinkable it was like something out of a hollywood sci-fi movie the ground gave way beneath our feet and these two were downcast 
They were sad as they walked. And in that situation, Jesus came to brighten their perspective. Jesus came to inform their understanding, not to change any of the situation, not to change the reality, but to help them see it from a different perspective. So here's our first takeaway. I think this is a truth that we need to hear on this Easter. The circumstances we face aren't nearly as important as the conclusions we draw. The problem wasn't what happened. The problem was the conclusions that they had come to as a result. Jesus challenged their assumptions, but he did so after he first walked with them and listened to them. And let me encourage you as as we continue to see more and more people affected by COVID, as we encounter more people who have lost someone to this pandemic, we must not belittle this time. Maybe for you, it's like, yeah, well, staying away from people has been great. I love it, right? You know, and I know some of you who have been absolutely thriving in this past year. It's, it's, you know, finally some time for you to stop commuting and your, your home and, and, and it's really working well for you. But for some people, those who have lost a loved one, those who've experienced absolute devastation from a financial perspective, for those of you who have suffered immensely from isolation. It's been a horrific, horrific time. And we must not treat it as though it is some trivial thing. And Jesus actually models for us how to minister to someone who's grieving. He walked with them and listened to them before he even spoke to them. The text says that it was a seven-mile journey. Who knows how long he had been just walking silently and listening, just listening. The text says uh, he observed and listened and watched. They had no idea who he was, which I guess is another lesson we can glean from this. We never know What's inside the people we're around, the people that we bump into every day, the people that we see from six you know, feet away in the grocery store, the people that we interact virtually, um, maybe chat with on our virtual coffee hour. We have no idea what's going on. I mean, really going on with them, who they really are. And doesn't Hebrews 13, 2 say, show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. So these two on the road saw this random guy. In fact, one of the two actually says, you're not from around here, are you? Like, how uninformed are you? Clearly, you don't have CNN. And Jesus is like, what what news? What, What are you talking about? the news about Jesus. And Jesus is like, "Hmm, who's he? So we must never assume that just talking to someone or seeing someone, what actually is happening on the inside. But Jesus, after he walks with them, after he listens to them, then he finally speaks to them. And when he does, Jesus challenges their assumptions. The conclusion that they came to uh, was that this whole thing was the end of the line. You know, why were they headed to Emmaus? Well, because the party was over in Jerusalem. They said, we had hoped. He was a prophet. He was the one that was going to redeem Israel. And what do we see? It was past tense. They thought, they thought their best days were behind them. They really thought Jesus had a lot of potential. Some of those miracles were pretty awesome. Too bad he had to die. He didn't tell them that what they had experienced wasn't brutal because it was. No doubt some PTSD to to see someone just, you know, wrenched from their lives and taken so viciously, suffocated publicly on a cross in front of them. And yet... What he was saying is that the conclusions you've come to as a result of this is what's incorrect. 
The same is true with the information from the women. You know, the women had reported that Jesus wasn't there anymore. They they heard that. And what was the conclusion? They came to the conclusion that, that the body must have been stolen. It seemed to them kind of an idle tale that the women had seen, seen angels. So same information, different conclusion. Jesus didn't say that the circumstances weren't hard. He just said, you've come to the wrong conclusions about it. Now listen, listen, what you're dealing with is difficult. It's painful. This is bad. This whole pandemic thing is bad. But what conclusions are you coming to? These two were suffering under the weight of a story that wasn't true. Jesus had died. But here's the question this Easter. Who told you to use the past tense? That's what Jesus is saying. I know, I know you're saying, you know, I was, but newsflash, I still am. I'm still standing. I did die, but now I am alive. And perhaps we're like those two men walking, using the past tense. Oh, that was my business, or my dream was, or I was living in the best time, and I can't believe this happened. And Jesus says, I've got more in front of you than there is behind you. Your best days are still to come. There's, there's great things on the horizon. Dawn is coming. He's about to do something. Let's come to different conclusions about the same circumstance. And once their assumptions were challenged, once they began to think correctly, because listen, wrong thinking will always lead to wrong living. And inaccurate information will lead to unnecessary fear. And once these guys began to see things correctly, they were open to a life of hope. It's so important we realize the power we have in taking the same information but coming to a different conclusion. Charles Swindoll said uh, once, uh, life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. Interesting, eh? You can't control what happens. You can't control that, that your business was lost, you, you, or your loved one dies, or even if your health is taken from you, you can't control what happens. That's 10%. 90% is that I'm going to kneel down and I'm going to say God gives and God takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. And so in our situation, we can still choose to respond in faith and respond in worship. And when he helped them, when Jesus helped them to see the same situation differently, once their eyes were open, they had potential that was that was unlocked by perspective. And what do I mean? I, I mean this. They previously viewed walking any further as futile, a futile endeavor. When Jesus indicated that he was still going, they were, you know, they were going to Emmaus. Um, you know, hey, this is our off ramp. We're going to go. And, and Jesus said, well, I'm going to go on. I'm going to walk on a little farther. And they said, are you kidding? No, you can't do that. It's too late. You can't be walking in the dark. They didn't have street lights back in those days. They didn't have flashlights on their iPhones. So once the natural illumination was gone, you really shouldn't be out walking. It's dangerous. And they said, no, 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 you can't walk farther. Well, no, don't do that. Come and stay with us. You could, you could set out on your journey tomorrow. So they viewed travel as no longer possible when they were uninformed. Once they were informed as to what was actually going on, things were different. Because just as they were walking, they couldn't see. But when Jesus was at the table breaking bread, they saw what they hadn't noticed before, the holes in his hands. Blessing and brokenness go together. The bread was broken as he blessed it. He was broken to bless us. Never assume that because your life is full of pain, that God is not there. They were given hope and they saw things differently, didn't they? Listen to this. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. 
They left that very hour and traveled the seven miles back to Jerusalem in the dark. What am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is hope gives you wings. I'm trying to say they did have light now, a light on the inside, knowing that Jesus was alive. And so what previously would have been an inconvenience, an impossibility, was now no big impediment at all. They were ready to rush back to Jerusalem. Never mind how dark it is. They had to let other people know. Hope will give you power to embrace what you previously wanted to escape. They wanted to be anywhere but Jerusalem, right? Before, because it was just full of reminders. It was triggers about the pain they had experienced. They, you know, there was a cross where Jesus died and there was a place where our dreams were crushed. And, and, and you know, we don't want to be here. And we can choose to have different conclusions on the same circumstance. It's all about perspective. Don't suffer under the weight of a story that isn't true. Don't put a period where God has put a comma. And don't use the past tense when God is a God who is not dead, but alive and has something in store for you. Here's what's true. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead has been called one of the greatest attested facts in all of history. There were eyewitness accounts who did see. No, we can't see or touch the print of his hands, but we can see the impact, the imprint left on those who did see and the joy they walked in for the rest of their lives. That hope and joy is ours as we believe and tell the greatest story. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that as this message goes into the kitchens and living rooms and bedrooms and cars, wherever all over this world, we thank you for your spirit in helping us to do what those two did. The moment they saw you, they had to tell. The moment they experienced, they had to share. And if you're listening to this and you've never said yes to Jesus, you've never turned your heart over to God who loves you, this is your moment. Right now, this is your time. I'm going to say a prayer. And if you're ready to turn away from the things that separate you from God and experience resurrection life, I want you to pray this prayer to God. Say it with your lips. Mean it with your heart. Dear God, I know that I can't fix myself, but I believe you can. Please come into my heart and make me new. I give myself to you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Happy Easter to each and every one of you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. We'll see you real soon. Bye.